All right, so in our last video, we considered the energy it would take to assemble a distribution of point charges, and that's this expression here, where I'm summing over all the charges in this assembly of point charges. Um, this is the charge of one of the uh, point charges in question, and VI is the potential generated by everything else. So ignoring that point charge I'm focusing on, I look at all the other point charges, calculate their, the potential they generate at the location of the point charge QI. Okay. What I want to do now is generalize this away from point charges to the systems where I have a continuous distribution of charge. Um, so let's imagine I have some charge density that's spread, like again, charge peanut butter, I spread it over my toast. Um, and I want to ask the question, um, what is the energy required to assemble um, that continuous distribution of charge? Okay, so what I'm going to do is consider little bits, right? So I'm going to say, all right, I have a little bit of charge here. I'm going to say that has charge dq, and I can write that as the density at that location times the volume element, dv. Okay, that's my little dq. Um, and what I want to do is count the energy it takes to place this in the presence of everything else. So they have to do some work to place that little bit of charge. And so now my energy, I can write a uh, expression analogous to this one where I have one half. And now I don't sum it. I do an integral over um, Q, which is now dQ, which is rho dV. So I end up with rho times the potential times dV. Okay. And so this is the energy required to assemble this continuously spread um, uh, bit of uh, charge, or this, this total um, mass of charge I've assembled here. Okay. Now there's an important distinction between these two expressions. Um, the distinction is the following. So when I write the potential here, this is the potential due to all charges. All charges. Okay, so I'm not doing the same thing where I ignore this one. So, you know, up here, what I said is that I calculate the potential at the location of this charge due to everything else. So I ignore the potential of the charge that I'm thinking about at the moment. Now, the reason I do that for a point charge, the potential of a point charge at its own location. So if I take a point charge and I calculate the potential due to it, the potential is infinite at its own location. Okay, So if I were to include the potential due to the charge i in this vi, I would pick up an infinity. So for every point charge, I pick up an infinity if I do that. And for physically, what that um, infinity represents is the self-energy of the point charge. And what I mean by that is the energy required to assemble the point charge itself. If you were to imagine taking little bits of charge and pressing them into a point charge. Um, what you're doing is taking a uh, charge and pressing it to zero separation from each other. So these little bits of charge, which are the same sign uh, of charge, would really want to get away from each other. So there's it's truly infinite energy required to compact charge onto a point. Okay. And um, so if you like, that's the energy required to create an electron, to assemble an electron. So classically, that energy is infinite. Okay, so we don't count that here because we assume the point charges come ready-made. But in this case, um, that self-energy is included, okay? But because I'm not compacting the charge down to a point, that self-energy is finite. And that self-energy is really, um, I'm after, I'm interested in that uh, self-energy when I'm trying to ask the question, how do I um, uh, assemble this charge distribution, okay? And so, the important distinction, this one includes the self-energy down here, this one does not, okay? Now, another way to say it is the self-energy of a little itty-bitty bit of charge here, dq, um, is negligible compared to the energy of the whole bulk charges put together, okay? Um, and so this, you know, you can view this as um, approximating the potential due to everything else by including the potential due to the charge you're focused on, okay? And that approximation, uh, because it's such an infinitesimal bit of charge, becomes formally an accurate description of, um, uh, of the energy. Okay, I've rambled too long on that. Okay, I have two expressions now, one for point charges, one for continuous distribution. Let me do one more thing in this video before I quit, and that is consider now the case of a conductor. So if I imagine if I have a conductor, 
um, conductors and insulators are just squiggly lines to me apparently and I put some charge on it plus Q um, the and then ask the question what does it take to assemble that charge what's the energy stored in that charge on the uh, on this conductor now this becomes simple because the uh, my expression for the energy associated with this is just one half times the integral of rho um, v dv but in a conductor I know v is constant everywhere so I can pull that out okay and then I just have rho dv and this just becomes one half QV. Okay, this is for a conductor only. So the energy required to, or the, you know, you can view it two ways. The energy required to assemble charge on this conductor, bringing it from infinity, um, can be written just as one half QV, where V is the potential of the conductor with all the charge on it, and Q is the, the, the total charge on the conductor. Okay, another way is if I were to release that energy stored on that conductor, how much energy would I get out? And these, this is the expression. Okay. All right, one more extension to that, and that is the following. If I have um, two conductors now, and let's imagine two conductors in which I um, use a battery, for example, or I use my Van der Graaff to drive charge from one to the other. Okay, so I will take charge off of this one, so uh, off of this one, and put it onto this one. And so the net result is I'll have some plus Q here, and I'll have minus Q here. So the net charge, I imagine I have a wire and say a battery. Okay, we'll talk more about batteries later. And I drive charge from one to the other, okay? And then let's take away the battery. Okay. And so what the net result is, I'm going to have these two conductors. Um, conductor 1, which will have potential V1 relative to infinity, and conductor v, uh, 2, which has potential V2. Um, so the energy to assemble that set of charges will be uh, the energy of conductor 1, uh, which will be minus Q V1. Um, plus, and I need it over 2, sorry, plus Q uh, V2 over 2, or I can write it as 1 half Q times delta V, okay, where um, delta V is uh, V1, or V2 minus V1 in this case, V2 minus V1, okay, all right, so we will um, uh, treat this, uh, basically what we're doing here is setting up what we'll call a capacitor. So this is a, a system of conductors where I'm moving charge from one conductor to another, um, establishing a potential difference between them, and I can store energy, okay, uh, between the two. Uh, all right, so let me stop there, and I'll talk more about capacitors in class uh, or in other videos.